Uh, thank you, Jason, so much. It's, uh, it's a joy to be here with you today. Um, very excited to be back on campus uh, here. Um, I'd like to thank the other speakers today uh, who I deeply respect and admire, especially uh, Your Excellency uh, Bishop Saratelli, uh, Dr. McNamara, Dr. Hahn, Dr. Bergsma, and also certainly thank uh, Rob Palladino and uh, Jason Lewis for the invitation to be here today. This conference is entitled uh, The Supper of the Lamb, Mass as Heaven on Earth, and my talk today, as Jason mentioned, is entitled Perspectives on Liturgical Music. Uh, the content of this talk will be very similar to the one that I gave just about a month ago to uh, the student liturgical musicians here. So I understand there's a contingent in this section of the church, right? Um, so please forgive me if I'm repeating anything. Uh, I hope that it will um, be enriching and not uh, boring for you. Um, as I said at the student musician retreat, um, the Franciscan University of Steubenville will always hold a, a very special place in my heart. Uh, the last time that I was here, with the exception of, of uh, the student retreat, uh, was um, at the end of my high school years. Uh, about 10 years ago, and believe it or not, I was attending a Steubenville youth conference, um, right about a, a little bit after a senior, senior in high school. Um, Although more than a decade has uh, intervened between then and now, I remain grateful for the impact that Franciscan has had on my life. So thank you for that. Uh, Franciscan University, and I suspect also uh, perhaps the Diocese of Steubenville, um, are known for their devotion to and love for Christ and his church, um, and also for its firm orthodoxy in regards uh, to the church's moral teachings for her lex credendi, as Bishop Saratelli uh, described this morning, or her law of belief. I hope that today we can consider the church's lex orandi, or law of prayer, which the church tells us is intimately connected to and even helps form uh, the law of belief. And so in this talk, I'd like for us to journey together through five perspectives from which we can view the question of liturgical music also in, in light of the new translation of the Roman Missal. Each one of the five perspectives will, in a way, build upon the other and will gradually take us from an almost purely subjective view of the question of liturgical music into um, an almost purely objective consideration of liturgical music. So the first perspective will be a, a personal perspective. The second will be a moral perspective the third, a legal perspective, and the fourth, a sacramental perspective, where I will make great use of uh, uh, Dr. McNamara's material, as I'm sure you'll see. Um, and then lastly, um, and uh, a theological perspective, where we will consider how liturgical music can make present to us and allow us to actively participate in the earthly liturgy, in the invisible realities of the heavenly supper of the Lamb. So I'd like to begin with uh, a personal perspective in looking at uh, liturgical music. And I'm sure that every single person here in this church, and indeed every single person who has come to the sacred liturgy has tread a unique path on their way there. We all come to the liturgy with our own life experiences, with our comforts and our pains, and our joys and our sorrows. And uh, this is surely a good thing, isn't it? Uh, Christ meets us in the Mass and, and embraces us where we are and guides us on our journey to holiness. I'd like to share only briefly a bit of my personal journey to the service of the liturgy through music. While I do, I hope that you will also reflect on your own personal journey if uh, some of you are liturgical ministers or if some of you are not. Um, you can reflect also on your, your journey to your participation in, in the liturgy. And so my own personal journey began in a small town in the Midwest, not too far from here, in fact, I think about 10 uh, hours to the north up in, in Michigan. Here we are. I had a guitar tossed in my lap uh, as a young child, and I played in my first mass in the third grade. 
Um, in one way or another, I've continually been involved in liturgical music ever since then. Uh, the music books in the pew were the Glory and Praise hymnal, which uh, a, few, a few years later was replaced by the Gather Comprehensive hymnal. And I think uh, many of us probably remember these or maybe even still use them in our parishes today. Uh, so my experience of liturgical music growing up was mostly seen through the lens of the St. Louis Jesuits um, and, and what some other musicians at my parish growing up affectionately called the Haugen Haas conspiracy, right? <laughs> We're familiar with this idea. Um, so my involvement in the singing and playing of this repertoire brought me right up to my teen years, where I continued to arrive at church with my acoustic guitar on Sunday mornings, often times uh, after a late night with my electric guitar somewhere else, right, the night before. Um, it was a very natural progression for me to soon gravitate toward the praise and worship genre of Christian music that was really coming about um, in evangelical communities at the time, and even, uh, to my surprise, in some Catholic parishes as well. It was actually on this very campus where I, I first encountered electric guitars and drum sets and modern rock-styled Christian music, not only in events like youth conferences, but also in the mass. So for me as a 17 or 18-year-old wannabe rock star, okay, um, and virtually lifelong folk mass guitarist, this for me was very much a revelation. It was not only the musical style that I had an affinity for that moved me, but it was also the love of Christ that this music was able to express to me and strengthen my faith and devotion. And I'll always remain grateful for the, for the way that the Lord has used this music to reach out to me at a time uh, where I was very much in need of the love of Christ. And from here, I went into my college years, where I found myself out west at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, only a few miles away from the parish that created and established the Life Teen program in the 1980s. Some of us are maybe familiar with the uh, Life Teen program. Um, I was soon plugged into the world of praise and worship liturgy that was so common in Phoenix at the time. And the parish where I served during this time was, uh, I'm told, the second Life Teen parish ever to exist, okay? Um, and many of the music directors and music musicians in the area were among the leading publisher, uh, uh, published composers and performers of contemporary Catholic music and so forth. So this is the liturgical culture that, that I quickly became immer immersed in at this time. Among my many experiences at, at this parish, one of the most striking to me was that uh, people my age, early college years, um, who had grown up at this parish thought that traditional Catholic music was, I will choose Christ and cry the gospel by Tom Booth. Has anyone heard of those before? Um, which was shocking to me because obviously I knew that traditional Catholic music was be not afraid and on eagle's wings. Um, this is a, re a revealing time for me. Um, but among the questions that were raised in my mind during this time, the question of tradition certainly was one of the strongest. So it caused me to set out on a quest to discover uh, the true Catholic sacred music tradition. And when I finally discovered it, I can tell you uh, that I was stunned. I vividly remember uh, discovering Renaissance polyphony for the first time. It was Palestrina's Misa Papa Marcelli. And I checked the CD out of the library at school, popped it in my CD player in the car, and on the ride home, I remember listening to the Kyrie over and over and over again, and I couldn't even get to the Gloria. Um, I simply melted into the transcendent beauty of this music, and I knew that what I was encountering was something truly sacred, truly beautiful, and truly Catholic, set apart from any other music that I'd ever known. And I soon discovered that Gregorian chant was the foundation of Western, the Western music tradition and was the music of the Catholic Church for its first thousand years and has had a continual presence in the Church's liturgy up to the present. 
began to study and learn about the music, this music with fervor and passion. My personal discovery of the sacred music tradition of the Catholic Church opened me to a world that I li literally never even knew existed. And among other things, it was the initial spark that ignited my pursuit of the, of the study of the sacred liturgy that, that has followed and continues in order that I might try to understand liturgical music and the liturgy that it is in service of more fully. So now, as compelling as the story may or may not be for you, um, and the story told here is simply a quick, quick loss and is far from over, as interesting as a vignette from my own personal life experience of liturgical music might be, um, we have to admit that this is just one singular subjective point of view, right? It does very little to contribute to the question of what liturgical music, and therefore the liturgy, is or ought to be. While the personal perspective is important, and it often engages the questions of, you know, what I like, right, or what I know, what I've experienced, we see these um, often in our conversations about the liturgy. Um, while, while those are important, we have to admit that these really aren't the best principles for viewing the question of liturgical music from an objective point of view. So for this, we'll have to take a look uh, at the question from a few different perspectives. Excuse me. And so I'd like to turn now to um, a moral perspective on the question of liturgical music, the second perspective moral, moral perspective. In his book, uh, The Spirit of the Liturgy, then Cardinal Ratzinger has given us what I believe is a kind of examination of conscience for liturgical musicians, drawing upon the moral effects that music has upon us. In his chapter on sacred music, the Pope recalls a dichotomy between two general types of music through the thought of Plato and Aristotle. These he calls the music of Apollo, or Apollonian music, and the music of Marsyas, which he describes as Dionysian music. We have Apollonian music on the one hand and Dionysian on the other. Uh, generally speaking, the Pope says that these two types of music affect the listener in one of two ways. Apollonian music, he says, uh, is music that engages the senses, but lifts them and draws them into the spirit and brings man to wholeness. It elevates the senses by uniting them, uniting them to the spirit. And then Dionysian music, he says, on the other hand, has the, the effect of intoxicating the senses. It crushes rationality, and in a sense, it subjects the spirit to the senses. This is essentially the effect of pure sensuality, I guess we could say. So this dichotomy strikes me as one that speaks directly to the morality of the passions. So let's look at the, what the Catechism has to say about uh, the morality of the passions for a second. Um, catechism 1763 says, in short, feelings or passions are emotions or movements of the sensitive appetite that incline us to act or not to act. And Catechism 1768 says, passions are morally good when they contribute to a good action, evil in the opposite case. So this is, we probably know this stuff. Catechism 1767 states, in themselves, passions are neither good nor evil, they are morally qualified to the extent that they are effectively, that they effectively engage the reason and the will. Passions are said to be voluntary either because they are commanded by the will or because the will does not place obstacles in their way. It belongs to the perfection of the moral or human good that the passions be governed by reason. So in other words, uh, the Catechism tells us here that the passions have to be subordinated to and governed by reason in order, in order for us to be in control of our passions and so the passions are not in control of us, right? 
Uh, music has the power to speak to our passions. Uh, we all know that different styles of music and different songs and pieces can affect us in different ways, right? Can you recall you know, some of this in your own life? I'm sure you can relate to this. Have you ever lost yourself in a song? Have you ever felt the need to find the right music for your mood, right? Uh, do you have a certain music that you're compelled to listen to when you're sad or experience heart, experiencing heartbreak? Or perhaps when you're angry and you need an outlet for your aggression, right? Music can, can help us with that too. Or how about the loud music and flashing lights at rock concerts? Have you ever found yourself being overwhelmed uh, by these effects and overcome by them. Or maybe sometimes we listen to music in a less engaged way and it becomes uh, sort of background music and it, it sets the mood, so to speak, or it breaks the silence and keeps our passions at something of an idol. Um, I know that I've, I've experienced all of these. Um, I'd like to suggest to you that in these cases we're seeing examples of Dionysian music in action. Okay, now, it's, this is not necessarily sinful, right? It's not morally wrong uh, to do these things, to listen to, to music that has that Dionysian effect on us. Um, that depends on the actions that we make as a result of our passions, just like the Catechism told us. Uh, so please hear me, I'm not suggesting in any way that it's morally wrong to listen to these kinds of music. Um, but you can see in these cases that our emotions in the senses in a certain sense become intoxicated uh, to the point where our spirit and will are perhaps crippled. And we're really, uh, so are we really at our full capacity to choose and act rightly, you know, in those situations? Perhaps. Now, on the other hand, have you ever listened to music that seemed to make you think more clearly in a rational way? that makes you more reflective and seems to enhance your ability to perceive beauty, truth, and goodness. Music that lifts our gaze to more elevated and eternal things. Are there styles of music that come to mind? Perhaps this is the effect of Apollonian music, uh, at least according to the Pope in his, in his book, Spirit of Liturgy. So these can happen uh, to greater or lesser effects, right? Uh, but the looming question now should be, how does this apply to the question of liturgical music? Um, I, I think that the answer should be clear, especially if we start to draw on Dr. McNamara's talk a little bit, which we will in, in a moment. The goal of music, the music of the liturgy, is not to shackle us in our flesh, to intoxicate our senses, right? and to leave us bound to the fallen world. The music of the liturgy should have the effect of Apollonian music and lift our gaze to the heavens. It helps us in the liturgy to be released from the effects of the fall and to set our sights, set our sights on and engage the divine. The music of the liturgy should certainly assist us in this ascent. It shouldn't prevent us from it, right? So the Pope has given us a litmus test, a kind of examination of conscience as we consider the music that we use in the liturgy. Now, um, this perspective might be helpful, it might not be, but I, you might agree with me, it's not really satisfying, is it? It's a little incomplete. Um, I think the reason is because we're still relying pretty heavily upon our subjective experience to try to sort these things out. Um, so we're going to have to dig just a little bit more deeply to arrive at a few more objective considerations of liturgical music. So we'll go uh, to the third perspective, which will be the legal perspective. So the legal perspective on the question of liturgical music. I'm sure that we can all remember at least those of us who work with, with the liturgy as liturgical musicians and perhaps um, other liturgical ministers and certainly pastors and, and so forth. Um, we cer certainly remember the time that we first encountered a thing called the germ, right? It's so affectionate. 
Um, the general instruction of the Roman Missal, along with the rubrics contained in the Missal itself, have the status of what we call liturgical law. And the church gives us this guide to the liturgy as a sort of roadmap for the right celebration of the sacred mysteries. The general instruction, we might say, is to the liturgy uh, as the catechism is to the faith. Um, the liturgical law is to the lex orandi as the catechism is to the lex credendi. And as I said at the outset of the talk, um, I know the reputation of this university and also um, of, this, of this diocese when it comes to the faithfulness to the moral teachings of the church. And I'm sure that all of us here today have also had a very strong desire not only to embrace what the church asks of us when it comes to um, our moral lives or our lex credendi, uh, if you will, and our lex uh, vivendi, which flows from, from there, um, but also know that the church has a lot to say about what right prayer, um, the way that right prayer complements and even helps form right belief, and from this, right living. And with our current implementation of the new translation of the Roman Missal, it seems also to be a good uh, time to look again at this general instruction, especially because it too, I'm not sure if everyone knows this, has recently been retranslated as well. So in 2003, we received a translation of the general instruction, put it, put it into to effect, but it's recently, in the last few months, been released um, a new translation of that same uh, general instruction of the Roman Missal. So dealing with legality is difficult, isn't it? We don't, we don't like this. Um, it's often not a very comfortable area of conversation. You know, we've all heard jokes about lawyers, right? Um, we also know that even in our system of law in the United States, there are murderers set free, innocent people imprisoned. Um, the reason for this, of course, I'd like to propose is because uh, rules and laws, though they are a most certain and sure guide to right practice, always are subject to interpretation and application, right? So I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with the code of canon law. Um, does anyone, do we have any canonists in the room? Um, does anyone know what canon two says, canon number two? in the code, pop quiz. Okay, more or less words, it says, this code does not define the rights which must be observed in celebrating liturgical actions. In other words, the code uh, does not cover liturgical law. This is stated at the outset of the code, and, uh, and the code has, has washed its hands clean of the liturgy here, and, uh, and perhaps for a reason. Um, now, I'm, I'm no canonist, but I've read a little bit about the development of the Code of Canon Law. Um, before the 1917 Code, I understand what was required to answer a question pertaining to church law essentially was an entire library of documents contained in many vaults and an incredibly talented canon lawyer who could sort through it all <laughs> to try to find the answer to a, to, to, to a church law question. So when the decision was made to codify church law, it was decided to exclude liturgical law because liturgical law itself was probably found in another completely wing, completely uh, different wing unto, unto itself. So there wasn't enough time to handle it all. So it's been left for scholars to codify in maybe subsequent centuries, another couple hundred years, maybe they'll take the task on, we'll see. Sometimes it might be useful to have a code of liturgical law, right? Um, so what this means is that although the general instruction is very clear, liturgical law is still always subject to interpretation and always must take into account the whole, the whole of the church's writings on the liturgy over the course of her 2,000 year plus history. Not simply a single contemporary document viewed in isolation, but the whole of what the church has said regarding the liturgy. It's no easy task, I'm sure. Um, while the Missal 
in its general instruction are very clear and indeed are a sure guide to right worship, I'd like to propose that if, if we read it in isolation, not taking into account the whole of the church's tradition and writings, we can get into very dangerous territory. If we view the general instruction in this way, and if we try hard enough, we can almost find a way to get around something, can't we? Or we can find a loophole, like lawyers sometimes, sometimes do. So this is where I think that many of our liturgical battles can go. Um, we, can, we can resort to trying to find loopholes to justify our practices, or we can try to uh, rationalize things sometimes, maybe in order to do what we, just what we really want to do. I think, I mean, we're all guilty of this, I'm, I'm sure, in some capacity, myself included. And most importantly, because we're Catholics, right, uh, we're very good at finding the bare minimum that we have to do in order to be licit. I mean, isn't this true? Um, we Catholics know the rules. Um, if you're like me, I'm sure that you are very certain the exact moment when Friday comes to a close when you're fasting during Lent. <laughs> or you have an uncanny ability to calculate exactly the time that communion is distributed um, at Mass, so you can quickly pound down that Egg McMuffin on your way to Mass. So we Catholics know how to do these things. We know the rules. But it's my hope that when it comes to the music of the liturgy, we'll always strive to do so much more than simply be legal. And always strive instead to embrace the fullness of the church's vision for music and liturgy. I'm sure we can easy, easily relate this to our lives of faith. We can certainly be licit by showing up to Mass on Sundays and going to confession yearly during Lent, but this is no path to holiness, is it? I mean, if, if, we, if, we, just get, if we just get by, our salvation can still be in, in great danger. So when we consider the church's teaching on right worship in proper liturgical music, let's always try to see the big picture. I'd like to, like to challenge us all to, to, to look for that uh, today, because if we focus on engaging in legal arguments over fine points only, then we might be bound to miss the boat. And so, with all this being said, I'd like to share just a few brief sections of the new translation of the Roman Missal. And we don't have time to look at this in detail. We did with the students. We, we dug into the, the Roman Missal just a little bit. Um, but I'd like to call your attention just to a few, um, a few translation changes that we have in our uh, 2011 general instruction of the Roman Missal. A few highlights for you to consider as you study, as you study it on your own. Uh, the new translation places an incredibly strong emphasis on the sung liturgy, is the model for liturgical celebration. The emphasis is on the chanting of the dialogue between priest and people, is the foundation for liturgical song, or liturgical chant, as the new translation calls it. The general instruction has retranslated a familiar passage that many of us have been hearing since the Second Vatican Council. And we have learned that Gregorian chant should have pride of place in liturgical services. I'm sure that we've all, all come across that at one point or another. However, the new translation says something different. It says Gregorian chant should have the main place all things being equal as being proper to the Roman liturgy. So the main place translates the Latin phrase principem locum, which we might also translate uh, principal place, first place. But main place, I think that, that works pretty well. So there's also an emphasis on, in this missal, in this translation of the general instruction, an emphasis on the singing of the antiphons in psalmody at the processions. So this would be the entrance and the offertory and the communion, especially from the proper of the mass as found in the antiphons of the Roman Missal itself 
in the church's books of Gregorian chant, the Graduale Romanum in the Graduale Simplex. And I always love to just ask this question. I, please don't be shy. Who has either heard of or seen the Graduale Romanum or Graduale Simplex in your life? That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. If we look at General Instruction 48 in 87, at the top of the list, we're asked by the church, and it applies to the offertory as well, uh, to use the, the antiphons and psalms from these liturgical books. It was, it was very much a revelation when I discovered this book for myself uh, several years ago. The general instruction allows for the singing of another liturgical chant that is suited to the sacred action, the day or the time of year that is approved by the, the Conference of Bishops or the Diocesan Bishop. But this is placed at the last of four options in our general instruction, and it's subordinated to the model of scriptural antiphons and psalmody as they're found in the first three options. Now, like I said before, talking, discussing legality is, is tough. So I'm going to leave it here right now. We're just going to move on to the next perspective. Like I said, uh, we, can, we can get into heated battles over legality. And, and it's still, as we can see, um, although a sure guide, it's, it's difficult and it's still incomplete, I think. I think we need a little bit more to try to understand the question of liturgical music in its fullness. So I'd like to dig a little bit more deeply into the question of why the church would place statements like these in our liturgical legislation, in our liturgical law. And so let's move to the fourth perspective that I'd like to consider today, and that's the sacramental perspective, a perspective that can help us assess the question of liturgical music from a more objective standpoint. Like I said, I'm going to uh, draw upon uh, my friend and teacher, Dr. McNamara, heavily on this, so uh, we'll be able to utilize some of what he put forth for church architecture and apply it uh, to the question of liturgical music. So just a quick review, what is a sacrament? Okay, the classic definition of a sacrament is as follows. A visible sign that makes present an invisible reality. So we're speaking generally here of sacramentality, uh, not necessarily the seven sacraments of the church, which efficaciously transmit grace. We're speaking of sacraments with a small s here, sacramentality. Um, Article 20 of the general instruction speaks to the sacramentality. And it says, the entire liturgy is carried out by means of perceptible signs by which the faith is nourished, strengthened, and expressed. And so does the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the Second Vatican Council, in Article 7. It says, in the liturgy, the sanctification of man is signified by signs perceptible to the senses and is affected in a way that corresponds with each of these signs. These signs signify and make present to our senses the invisible realities of the liturgy, just like architecture in sacred art, and so forth does. So what are these realities? What are the invisible realities of the liturgy that sacred art and liturgical music, sacred architecture, reveal to us? Let's look at Sacrosanctum Concilium Article 8 and see if it can help us with, with that question. And here it is, a full paragraph. In the earthly liturgy, we take part in a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy, which is celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem toward which we journey as pilgrims, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, a minister of the holies and of the true tabernacle. We sing a hymn to the Lord's glory with all the warriors of the heavenly army, venerating the memory of the saints. We hope for some part in fellowship with them we eager, eagerly await the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, until he, our life, sh shall appear, and we too will appear with him in glory. 
So we see that the earthly liturgy is comprised of signs and symbols that make present to us an invisible reality. But what is that reality first and foremost that is invisibly present in the liturgy? And now we finally arrive at the theme of this conference, right? It's the heavenly liturgy. We participate in the heavenly liturgy when we participate in the earthly liturgy. In the earthly liturgy, we experience a foretaste of heaven. So let's consider why we need the liturgy and these signs and symbols that allow us to participate in the heavenly reality. I'm going to get into some McNamarian thought here. Although God has given us the fullness of salvation in Christ, we're still bound by the effects of the fall in the period of image, right? At the end of time, when Christ returns and the earth is restored to its original purity, God will be all in all, and we will see him face to face. But until then, since Christ has been revealed to us and has accomplished for us salvation, we're only able to participate in the heavenly liturgy as, as a foretaste and through sacramental signs in the liturgy. The Eucharist par excellence is the sacrament of sacraments, right? the source and summit of the life of the church, the most efficacious presence of Christ on this earth. It is the Eucharistic sacrifice that's central to the, to the earthly liturgy. But what about the other signs and symbols of the liturgy, like sacred art, architecture, the texts, the gestures, the vestments, and, and sacred vessels, sacred music? What is their purpose? And the answer to this, of course, is that they're sacraments. They're visible, and in our case, they're audible uh, signs that make present to us invisible realities of the heavenly liturgy in which we truly participate in the earthly liturgy. So when we think about music as a sacrament, we acknowledge that it makes something present to us. The music of the liturgy not only affects us in an emotional way, although it does that, it engages our senses and it should unite them to our spirit, give us wholeness of being so that we're able to lift our gaze to the heavenly reality that is invisibly present to us in the sacred liturgy. When we ask ourselves what the music of the liturgy should sound like, what should our first answer be? Angela, Kevin. I'd like to propose that our first answer should be that liturgical music should sound like the music of the heavenly liturgy, sung by the heavenly hosts of angels and saints surrounding the throne of heaven. Although this is perhaps an abstract idea to us and is one that composers and artists have to grapple with, I think it should tell us a few things. If liturgical music should make present to us the reality of the heavenly liturgy in which we engage and indeed participate in the earthly liturgy, how about what could we say that liturgical music should not be for a moment? When we hear music that sounds like the music that we hear at the mall in the mass, does this make sacramentally present to us the reality of heaven? When we hear music that sounds like what we hear on the radio in our car, does this make us think of heaven? And I think the answer probably is no sometimes, most of the time. So this is why the church calls liturgical music sacred music. Vatican II calls it sacred music. Sacred means set apart. And this is exactly what the sacred music tradition of the church has always been and really should always be. It's the music that is it is music that's dramatically different than that of everyday life. So should our architecture be for churches? So should our manner of speech be, as we see with the new translation? And we see in the more elevated language, yes, like I just said, in the new translation of the Missal, the signs and symbols used in the liturgy of which liturgical music is a part are set apart from the ordinary and form an articulate sacramental language that is safeguarded, nurtured, and cultivated by the church, and which is reserved for the worship of God. 
and for our sacramental participation in the heavenly reality. And so finally, I'd like to arrive now at the, at the last perspective uh, with which we can look at the question of liturgical music. And that is the theological perspective. And I think the sacramental uh, perspective helps us arrive uh, now at a, at a theological consideration um, of liturgical music. <clears throat> so as Dr. Ma Dr. McNamara described, um, sacramentality deals with what we, we can call ontology. Um, ontology is the fancy word that essentially means the nature of being, essence. And the classic definition of beauty in our Catholic tradition is not that it is found in the eye of the beholder, right? The proper understanding of beauty in the Catholic context is much more of a theological, objective consideration. The truly Catholic definition of beauty is that something is beautiful when it reveals its ontology most clearly. So when it reveals its essence, it makes that presence, that essence present to us. When, he, when, it, when it reveals what it truly is most effectively. So when we ask whether a piece of liturgical music is beautiful, we really are asking if it is revealing its ontology or its, its essence to us. And, and therefore, if it's revealing to us the ontology of the liturgy, because the, the liturgical music, by definition, is in service of the liturgy, right? Without the liturgy, it's not liturgical music. So it needs to reveal to us the ontology of the liturgy. So what's the ontology of the liturgy? This, finally, is an objective theological question. Subjective consideration is mostly left behind here. What I like, what I don't like, the way I grew up, what my parish does, it's not so much a concern when we look at the ontological question. We can look at liturgical theology from a number of different angles. I'm sure the liturgy is at the very center of the church's life and theological reflection on the nature of the liturgy surely can never be exhausted. But I would like for us to focus just on one particular theological element of the liturgy, which goes beyond our consideration of the eschatological dimension of the earthly liturgy even. And the theological reality of the liturgy that I'd like for us to consider is this that in the sacred liturgy, it is Christ who acts. And in the sacred liturgy, it is Christ who speaks. In the sacred liturgy, the prayer of Christ is offered to the Father for the salvation of the world. Therefore, the content of the liturgy, or the agent of the liturgy, is the logos, the word of God, Christ who was with God and the Father from the beginning, and who in the fullness of time was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the liturgy is the action of Christ, the great prayer of the church, and we participate, we actively participate in that action of Christ as part of his body in the liturgical assembly. So in the liturgy, how do we worship God? I mean, is it, a, is it a personal time of prayer where we offer our own personal worship to God? I mean, this is a good thing for us to constantly do in our lives, isn't it? Um, but this is fundamentally not what we do in the liturgy. Because in the liturgy, it's Christ himself who offers perfect worship to the Father. Right? We participate in this perfect worship of God, the Father, and are ourselves offered to him as members of his own body. And so, to arrive at our final question, what role does sacred music play in this great prayer of Christ? That's the sacred liturgy. And this is sort of my point of arrival in this talk, if I've, if I've bored you uh, up into this point. This, is, this will be important. St. Augustine said that singing is for the one who loves. In Christ's prayer, in the liturgy, is, is the ultimate song of love, isn't it? the ultimate prayer of sacrifice. Is it any wonder why the church asks us to sing the liturgy? 
For it is in the song of the liturgy where the voice of Christ, the word of God, the Logos, is made incarnate in our midst. Sacramentally. And I think this is worth repeating. It is in the song of the liturgy where the voice of Christ, the very word of God, the Logos, is made incarnate, made flesh in our midst. It is in the texts of the liturgy, sung as the love song of the Trinity, where the word of God, Christ, is sacramentally made flesh and dwells among us. So my question to you is, how much does this change our discussion about songs that we like to sing at Mass, right? So the song of the liturgy, um, the general instruction tells us, is liturgical chant. There are chants that belong to the priest as the visible head of Christ, uh, to the people, the assembled body of Christ. And there's also a role given to the choir, or the schola cantorum, as it's called in the general instruction. And one of the roles historically given to the schola cantorum, of which the assembly may also take a part, is the singing of the proper of the Mass. And the, the form of the proper of the Mass is primarily made up of antiphons and psalmody, as we see demonstrated in General Instruction uh, 48 and 87, which uh, uh, relate to the entrance, offertory, and communion chants. The texts of the proper of the Mass are taken primarily from Scripture and are overwhelmingly from the book of Psalms. And we can recall that the Psalms have always played an integral role in the life of the church, not only in the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, but from the very beginning of Christianity, the Psalms have also been central to the Eucharistic Liturgy. In the spirit of the Liturgy, Pope Benedict tells us why the Psalms are so important for Christian worship and prayer. Um, we recall that the, the primary author of the Psalms is, is, um, is King David. And the Pope says, The Holy Spirit, who had inspired David to sing and to pray, moves him to speak of Christ, indeed causes him to become the very mouth of Christ, thus enabling us in the Psalms to, sp us in the Psalms to speak through Christ in the Holy Spirit to the Father. How profound is this? Christ, who is the son of David, assumes and prays the Psalms of David himself and continues to do so throughout history in the period of the historical period of image through his mystical body, the church, in his eternal prayer of praise to the Father. This is how important the Psalms are to Christian worship. So when we sing the liturgical chants of the Mass, which is com comprised of liturgical and scriptural texts, of which Gregorian chant is the supreme model, we make sacramentally present in the liturgy the voice of Christ, who offers perfect worship to the Father and sanctifies his body. The role of liturgical music, therefore, is to sacramentally give voice to the love song of Christ to the Father, in the Holy Spirit, through his mystical body, the church. So in conclusion, I would like to end with the entrance antiphon for the second Sunday after the Nativity, as it's found in the Roman Missal in the Graduale Romanum, which speaks most beautifully and poetically of Christ's incarnation, his becoming flesh, and dwelling among us. And here it is. While a profound silence enveloped all things, and night was in the midst of her course, your all-powerful word, O Lord, leapt down from your royal throne. In every mass, amidst the profound and sacred silence that envelops us, in the midnight of our earthly lives, the all-powerful word of God leaps down from the throne of heaven to dwell with us and to speak to us 
through the liturgical chant of the Mass. My prayer today is that we would embrace the sacred song that the Church has nurtured in her bosom over the centuries and has handed down to us with the lips of the saints. Let us be humbled at this great gift of God, the sacramental voice of Christ, speaking through his mystical body, giving perfect praise to the Father in the sacred liturgy. Let us strive to hear Christ's voice in the sacred song of the Mass and to heed his word and to be transformed by it. Thank you.